Hello and welcome to Hopkins at Home. I'm Dr. Jerry Burgess, Director of the Graduate Program in Environmental Sciences and Policy here at Johns Hopkins. And I'm going to be providing some introduction and some context for our program on the, the business of saving the planet. So we welcome you to ask any questions and we'll leave time at the end for my colleague in the environmental programs, Dr. Jennifer DeRosa, to engage our panelists with your queries. Now, why are we here, right? It, it, it's probably worth a moment to give a little bit of perspective. So halfway through the 20th century, smog chokes, chokes cities from Pittsburgh to Los Angeles. Uh, a recent oil spill had blackened Santa Barbara's beaches and, and Cleveland's Cuyahoga River had caught fire multiple times. So in the face of widespread industrial degradation across the country, the public, the public rose in outrage, environmental visionaries rose to the task with an onslaught of truly bipartisan environmental legislation. And it was a, a productive period for environmental leaders. And at, at the same time, many companies saw environmental problems as a, as a bit of a side issue, or for some, even an obstacle to their real business of making promise. Uh, profits. But as we lean into the, the third decade of the 21st century with increasing globalization and climate change and a, and a staggering loss in biodiversity, we are gathered here to hear from three environmental leaders who have demonstrated true and lasting transformational leadership. The, the kind of leadership we need moving forward. And again, the reason we're here today now, much of, the, of what one might call the new world order of environmental leadership will come from activists and scientists, business leaders, and of course, our terrific undergraduate and graduate environmental students. These students and Hopkins environmental alumni, like Scott Atkinson, who is our moderator, will forge ahead with the work being undertaken, already undertaken by our guests and other leaders. Scott is a managing partner and co-head of Hydrogen Struggles Global Sustainability Office, where he, he places senior leaders within companies and organizations that focus on advancing environmental and social impact initiatives uh, across the globe. Recently, he's helped build the senior leadership of places like Impossible Foods, the National Geographic Society, the World Bank, and yes, the Jane Goodall Institute. Scott is a force of nature, whether he's surfing off the coast of Hawaii or doing deep intellectual dives into how business can be a driving force to save our planet. So we're here today due to his incredible efforts and drive to do the right thing. Now, in no specific order, let's begin with our conservation and environmental leadership panelists, starting with Lisa Jackson, who holds a master's degree in chemical engineering from Princeton University and who is currently Apple's vice president of environment policy and social initiatives. Lisa, Lisa oversees Apple's efforts to minimize the impact on the environment by addressing climate change through renewable energy and energy efficiency, using greener materials and inventing new ways to conserve our precious resources. Now, others might know Lisa from her work as administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency under President Barack Obama. Now, moving to Ryan Jeller, who has a, has a law degree from the University of Utah and an MBA from the Florida Institute of Technology. He is the CEO of Patagonia Works. Now, that's the umbrella company for all of Patagonia's ventures, from clothing to documentaries, and under his leadership, Patagonia launched its first global environmental campaign around the European initiative, and that was Save the Blue Heart of Europe. It's, it's an international crusade to protect the last wild rivers of Europe from, from over 3,000 hydroelectric projects. Now, he also, I think this is quite interesting, he launched Patagonia Action Works in the region, which is an online tool to connect people with local and global environmental groups, and that allows folks to take action on the causes that they care about. And in a recent interview, Ryan states that, quote, we will continue to use every element of Patagonia, our people, our voice, our resources, and our business to do everything we can to save our home planet. And now let's move on to Dr. Jane Goodall, who in 1960 began her landmark study of chimpanzee behavior in what is now Tanzania. Her, 
her field research at the chimpanzee reserve, and most notably her, her discovery that chimpanzees make and use tools revolutionized the world of primatology and redefined the relationship between humans and animals. Now in 1977, she established the Jane Goodall Institute, where if I could take, take a moment to comment that a couple of our students from our environmental science and policy program are currently working to help Dr. Goodall's work around the world. The Institute continues the field research at the reserve and it builds on Dr. Goodall's innovative approach to conservation, which recognizes the central role that people play in the well being of animals and the environment. Now, in 1991, she founded Roots and Shoots, and that's a global program that empowers young people. And, and since its inception, it's greatly impacted youth in over 100 countries to act as informed conservation leaders that the world so urgently needs. Now today, Dr. Goodall is a UNM messenger of peace and we're pleased, very pleased to have all four of these leaders with us here at Hopkins and Home. One last word. We know, we know that leadership can emerge from environments that are inclusive, innovative and collaborative and therefore they're more effective. We also know that successfully solving pressing and complex wicked environmental issues require meaningful dialogue that, that incorporates diverse opinions and leaders, they need to start thinking proactively starting yesterday about everything from normalizing remote work to incentivizing green transportation, investing in sustainable sourcing and, and supply chain practices to, to funding environmental restoration efforts and environmental education at large. We also know that environmental leadership does not happen unless folks step up. So we've invited you here to join us on our collective crusade to make a difference. So today we are privileged to engage in dialogue with transformational leaders that have focused on unique environmental issues at local, regional, national, and international level, levels. And the, their efforts, their efforts serve as a model for others facing similar challenges who seek effective, constructive and sustainable outcomes. So once again, welcome to this discussion with Dr. Jane Goodall, Ryan Jellert and Lisa Jackson on environmental leadership and the business of saving the planet. Mr. Atkinson, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dr. Burgess. And hello, everyone. We're going to jump into our discussion very quickly today. But first, the Hopkins students, uh, my fellow alums, would be very disappointed if I didn't first acknowledge and thank you. Um, you're an incredible leader of the Environmental Sciences and Policies Master Program at Hopkins uh, and an incredible professor. Whether it's an online class on forest ecosystems or leading a field expedition in the Galapagos, uh, I can say uh, quite confidently that Dr. Burgess always finds a way to inspire his students through a combination of knowledge, authentic care, um, and just passion. Um, and this panel would not exist without you being a champion of it. So thank you. Um, all right, no more thank yous or acknowledgements. Let's get into things. Uh, today, we wanted to focus on defining and transformative moments through three exceptional lives and leaders. And Jane, we wanted to start our conversation around defining and transform transformative moments with you. You've had many. And coming into this discussion, I was listening to your new podcast called Podcast. I love, it's amazing. And also I watched your documentary, The Hope, which talks about your life as an activist and a leader and your relentless, relentless <laughs> commitment and determination to spread a message of hope. And I know that this may be an impossible question, um, but at a minimum, it's a setup question. Uh, but is there one defining moment that solidified your so that solidified you to your work uh, on behalf of the planet? Well, um, Scott, it is impossible really to answer that. But there are. Let me pick two rather than one. Okay, may pick two. First of all, it was 
meeting Dr. Lewis Leakey, who gave me the opportunity to go and study the chimps, that really was an absolutely defining moment because it set me on my career to learn about chimpanzees. But then the second phase was leaving the place I love best in the world, Gombe National Park, to talk about the threats that we've already just heard mentioned uh, that are facing the planet today. And that happened in 1987, when I flew over the tiny national, uh, national park of Gombe, which had been part of the rainforest stretching right across to West Africa, this central um, the equatorial forest belt. And I looked down and I knew there was deforestation. I was not prepared to see totally bare hills, more people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere, farmland overused and infertile, people struggling to survive. And that's when it absolutely hit me. If we don't help these people to find ways of living without destroying their environment, we can't save chimps, forests or anything else. So that, that made me totally committed to doing what I could for the planet and the future. Jane, when you had that moment and visually seeing the impact, what was, what was the first step after that? I mean, I, I imagine that there is a, a moment of either um, energy to combat or, you know, frankly, a sap of energy because of the sadness of seeing that. But I'm just curious of what, transpired after that moment for you? Well, after that moment, I just became infused with determination to try and do something about it. I hadn't the faintest idea what to do, but luckily all my life I've been um, able to call on amazing people who've been so supportive and helpful. And, you know, it started with my mother and Louis Leakey and all the rest of it. But uh, what, what I decided to do along with a wonderful man, George Strunden was to start a program to help the people. And that was Take Care or Takari, as we call it, which is the Jane Goodall Institute method of community-based conservation. And that actually launched in 94. It took a while to get money. Biggest problem, the EU said, you're asking for too little money. And I said, but we can't ask for more because nobody's done quite this before. It's, it's a very holistic program. And eventually they said, all right, we'll give you the money and you can have it for three years. So that's how it all began. Wow. I, I can relate in a different way to, and I, and I, um, I'd say a fellow student of mine would call, uh, call these mind bombs, but I can relate to the, the, you know, the emotive experience of seeing something visually happen to the planet. And specifically in our, in a previous panel, we had, um, the CEO, uh, Will Marshall, uh, the CEO of Planet Labs, Will Marshall speak, and his company takes a snapshot of the world, one snapshot a day. And for me, I was blown away looking at the you know, five-year set of visual photographs of Northern California during the drought, and specifically seeing the transformation happened to the land, to the rivers, to the watersheds here locally. So I can relate in a different way. And certainly it wasn't a plane, it was by seeing some geospatial photographs, but um, you know, those, those mind bombs can be quite powerful. Yeah, and we, 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 do, we do use those uh, uh, satellite imagery maps in our work today. Yeah. Well, on the note and on the topic of technology, maybe this is a good way to segue to you, Lisa. And it's the same question, you know, are there, is there a moment or are there moments that solidified your commitment to work on behalf of people and planet? Thanks, Scott. Uh, let me just start by saying what an honor it is to be here, to thank the administrators and faculty of the university and you for inviting me. Huge honor to be with my uh, co-panelists, uh, Ryan, and of course, the amazing Jane Goodall. Uh, I have a different moment. Uh, it goes back to being a young girl growing up. I, I was, uh, I grew up in New Orleans on the Gulf Coast of the United States. 
Uh, in fact, the house I grew up in no longer stands. It was destroyed by Hurricane Katrina uh, in 2005. Um, when my mother was living there at the time, obviously, she, luckily, she was not in the house. Um, some of her neighbors did not survive the actual hurricane, but the house I grew up with in and everything she owned was destroyed in that, in that hurricane. Um, but my moment actually came earlier because I was growing up during the age of revelation about the kind of pollution that Dr. Burgess started with. You know, I, the mouth of the Mississippi River, by the time the Mississippi River gets to New Orleans and gives us our drinking water, it's passed through uh, farm fields and all manner of uh, petrochemical factories. And so as I was, in high school, studies were beginning to come out from scientists who said that there were hundreds of carcinogens in the drinking water uh, for Louisiana uh, natives. Uh, and there became known this area of the river, um, the Mississippi River, which was lined with chemical plants called Cancer Alley because of the impact on air pollution in that air shed and water pollution in that uh, watershed. And I, I became really interested in that. I really wanted to be a doctor as a young girl. I was really good in science, really great in math. And so of course my teachers were pushing me towards a field in science. And I had a pediatrician growing up who was a woman, um, which is one of my lessons is always, you have to see it to believe you can be it. And uh, Dr. Wexler taught me that I could be it uh, just by her very presence. So I was gonna be a doctor like she was, but when I was in high school, um, because I was so good in math, the engineering department at Tulane University was running a program to get black students interested in engineering. I had never heard of engineering. I thought engineers worked on trains. Uh, and so I went to the, the summer program, uh, all because they promised to give us a programmable calculator at the end of the day. And I learned what a chemical engineer was. Uh, and I, over time, changed my major from pre-med to chemical engineering. I did go to Tulane undergrad, I rolled Green Wave. And um, I, I learned that chemical engineers are responsible for a lot of the processes that make industrial pollution. And so I came to believe that just like a doctor does no harm, engineers should do no harm. And so I wanted to be in this field of cleaning up and preventing pollution. Um, and I went to Princeton and did my graduate work there when there was a lot of groundwater um, uh, contamination and studies going on at the Environmental Studies uh, Institute there. Uh, and one of my first jobs, I went to a nonprofit, but my first big, big job was at the EPA, the US Environmental Protection Agency, because at that time, if you wanted to work on these issues, that was the place to be in the whole wide world. So, uh, you know, it all comes, what I love about Jane's story is that as much as she studies the natural world and is a champion of it, she always speaks about people. This interplay, you know, we are part of nature, we are part of the ecosystem, but we're the part that has the responsibility for, in, you know, protecting and conserving nature, not just because of the beauty of it, which is great, but because of a young girl like me in New Orleans who's worried about the impact on, on human health of not having clean air, clean water, or having a changing climate. Lisa, I, I have to ask, um, clearly you're at Apple right now, and you talked about being at the EPA, working at the EPA. I'm just, I, I mean, going from the EPA to Apple, that's a huge jump. Um, you know, going to work at the White House as the administrator to the vice president of one of the largest companies on the planet uh, and focusing on environment policy and social initiatives. Can you share that journey with us? And, and what specifically was your experience shifting from the public sector to, to the private sector? Sure. Um, you know, I the the head of the EPA, administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, was the greatest honor of my life. I mean, I started at that agency, and then to come back twenty plus years later to lead it, 
Um, and much like today, to lead it through a time when it had not been funded adequately and where many of the professionals who had given their careers to, to the science of protecting human health and the environment were demoralized. Um, and so it was my privilege to be able to come into that uh, space and work for President Obama. We did the clean car rules, which are very much in the news now again. We did the endangerment finding on uh, greenhouse gases. We worked hard on environmental justice. It makes me really happy to see President Biden now emphasizing environmental justice again, but we know that there are communities in this world really, but certainly in our country where if they're not clean, our country can't claim to have tackled environmental protection and, and successfully provided it. And so we did a lot of work there as well. Um, but after four years, I did the, the first term with President Obama, I had decided to, um, to move on and I really was going to take some time off. Washington DC is a, uh, a really important place but it's also an exhausting place, especially with the state of politics uh, around climate change, which shouldn't be political at all, but unfortunately is. Um, and Tim Cook, who's the CEO and my boss now, uh, I'd met him a couple of times uh, and he has a deep and abiding personal interest in this set of issues, uh, convinced me to come and just visit Apple. That was what he said, just come visit, come see what we do out here. Uh, but you know he's he's smart smart as could be as as many people say about him all the time and he knew that um, I wanted a job that would have as much impact and influence you know I tell people all the time especially women and people of color power is a good thing you want power if it's to do and accomplish the things that you're trying to accomplish I mean you have to be humble with it but at EPA, there's influence and power. We make a decision at EPA, you can affect tens of millions of lives, if not more, across the country in terms of health. Apple has the ability to have that scope of influence. You know, I say that humbly, but we're a consumer products company. And so when we decided and announced, as we did last June, that we're going to be carbon neutral for our entire supply chain by 2030 in nine more years, it's huge because it wipes away a lot of the excuse making that others might be willing to do. So I do love it here. I think I'm a little bit back to my engineering roots, but uh, it is a big jump in many ways from public to private sector, but I feel like I didn't lose anything in terms of the ability to have the power to hopefully bring to bear on these really pressing problems. Well, I appreciate you sharing your, your story with us, Lisa. And for us, I mean, the, the business of saving the planet, planet needs to be, um, you know, international, intergenerational. It needs to be diverse in terms of gender and ethnicity. It also needs to be interdisciplinary. And, you know, um, we need more risk takers uh, and individuals that are willing to translate their experiences from the private sector to the public sector, from the public sector to the private sector. I mean, and so I just commend you in being a leader in making that transition cut because, you know, you make it look much easier than the reality of what that transition entails. Thanks. That's, um, that's kind. So, and Ryan, I want to loop you into this conversation. And again, you know, we want to know about defining and transformative moments. But first, and I personally, this is going to be very selfish, but I wouldn't um, forgive myself if I didn't mention that Patagonia played a significant influence in my decision to pursue my master's. Namely, I picked up this book, which might look familiar, randomly at a Patagonia store I want to say about four years ago, and while it was originally written as a philosophical manual for employees at Patagonia, it became a source of inspiration for me for how to think about how we might be able to reshape our environment society through business. And I read the book and immediately after highlighting every page and underlining every word, I immediately wrote my application uh, for the Johns Hopkins master's program after reading that book. And then side note, this is gonna show how crazy I am. 
Uh, and Lisa, you'll get a kick out of this because you sit on the board of Conservation International. I volunteer with the Surf Conservation Partnership, which is a joint effort between Save the Waves Coalition and Conservation International. And we protect surf ecosystems around the world, but we're increasingly doing a lot in Central and South America. So I needed to dust off my Spanish language skills. So I bought the book in Spanish. And then I also volunteer, and Jane, you'll appreciate this because this is a mutual friend, with Earth League International, which protects Earth uh, through intelligence gathering operations. And the founder of Earth League International, Andrea Crosta, is originally from Italy. So I bought the book in Italian as well to dust off my Italian. So anyway, it's a long way to say... Um, a sincere thank you to you, Ryan, the Schnard family, and most importantly, the employees at pa Patagonia and whoever is in charge of that Patagonia book selection in your stores mm -hmm. has personally impacted my life. So anyway, I'll kick it back to you, but I'd be curious to hear a little bit about, you know, defining and transformative moments in your life. And frankly, you know, also we'd love to know about, uh, well, I'll just leave that question there for you to, to answer it. Cool. Well, thanks, Scott. Thanks for the the plug for uh, for all things Patagonia. It sounded a little bit like an infomercial there for a second, but thank you. Always take it. Um, let me also say, as as Lisa did, just I'm, I'm really honored to be here. You know, to share this this opportunity with Johns Hopkins, but to do it with Jane Goodall and, and Lisa Jackson, um, huge fans of the work that both of you do. So really an honor for me. Um, you know, I think transformative moments, I'm going to come at it differently than the other two have. First of all, I think my my path to working in environmental movement has really come through a passion for the places and, and through sports specifically. I grew up in Cocoa Beach, Florida. I grew up around surfing. So I've been around it most of my life. Matter of fact, almost my entire life. I think that I am probably the worst surfer on earth for somebody who spent as much time around it as I have. But it had a profound impact on me at a young age. Um, I was skateboarding, then I got into snowboarding. Ultimately, I got into rock climbing. And that was the thing that just I, I did, realized as soon as the first day I went rock climbing, I'll spend the rest of my life um, in and around this sport. And I think that that led to me working for 15 years for a company called Black Diamond Equipment based in Salt Lake City, where I had moved. And through the time that I was with Black Diamond, got involved with really working on environmental issues in our backyard. So in the Wasatch around Salt Lake and also in the desert Southwest, um, which uh, includes an area that is now Bears Ears National Monument. And so that was kind of my first foray into environmental work. I came to work at Patagonia, went over to Europe, spent the last six years there. And in that time, I was able to operate on the front lines of a number of campaigns and issues, topics across the European continent that had a really, really profound impact on me. And Dr. Burgess was nice enough to speak at some length about one that's near and dear to my heart, which is the saving the blue heart of Europe. So across all of Europe, if you look at a map of the waterways, everything is either dammed, channelized, or both across the entire continent. The only real exceptions are off in remote parts of Russia and the Balkan Peninsula. And the Balkan Peninsula, those rivers have been protected uh, mostly through just human conflict in the last couple of generations. And the fact that they've been protected regardless of how I think is a great opportunity. The reality, as Dr. Burgess mentioned, is there's over 3,000 hydropower projects currently queued up for those rivers. And spending time sleeping along the banks of the Una River in Bosnia or the Viosa River in Albania and meeting communities who are going to be permanently displaced from places where they and their ancestors have lived for hundreds of years and knowing about the biodiversity that depends on those rivers. And just looking at all the mistakes that we have made around the world by damming and channelizing rivers and knowing that we've got the opportunity to do something really unique here and maybe avoid making those mistakes before the entire European continent is, is transformed irreparably um, has brought us into that. And so for the last six years, we've been uh, supporting NGOs working on these issues. And right now, in anticipation of the Albanian parliamentary elections, which are on April 25th, 
we've done a six minute film piece and we've been campaigning really heavily to turn the Viosa River into Europe's first wild river national park. It's a river that currently flows for 272 kilometers from the mountains of Greece across Albania to the Adriatic Sea, completely unimpeded. And uh, we really feel that it's worth protecting. So that that is but one moment that's had a really profound impact on me. I think the other thing I'd say is, you know, I'm still looking for more of those moments. Um, you know, I feel like they're out there and, and finding them every day. Um, certainly the world is full of them. Um, so I think just continuing to be really aware of, of where we can have an impact, particularly at the intersection of the climate, the ecological, and the many social crises that, that we're navigating as humans right now. Ryan, I almost wonder if you yourself knowingly, unknowingly are going through your transformative moment right now. Because you've been CEO, when were you named CEO of Patagonia? Yeah, about six, seven months ago in the fall of 2020. I mean, in the middle of pandemic, in a, in a time where we are facing, um, you know, quite glaring, you know, social injustice issues as well. I, I'm just curious about the moment for you, maybe even being now, and I'd, we'd love, and I'm sure the audience would too, to hear a little bit about that transition and what this time has meant in your in your life. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. I heard somebody describe this last year, and I thought they just they did it perfectly. I think it was actually Daryl Walker from the Ford Foundation, and he said, you know, 2020 was like 1918, 1929, and 1968 all rolled into one. You know, a, a once in a century pandemic an economic crisis, unlike then and now even of greater scale in some ways, um, unprecedented in human history, and then the social, um, the social justice movements in 1968. I think that, you know, for me in this role, um, I think on, and, and by the way, all of that with the climate and ecological crisis just lurking in the background, lest us not forget. And so um, I think that for me, trying to step in and ensure that we are taking care of our people, that we're putting them in a position where they can look after each other, their families, their friends. We're keeping the business stable, which is a responsibility, but that's not the leading edge of what we're focused on. That we're continuing to champion issues that we think are critical to our communities around the world. Um, and that we're navigating and finding our voice on uh, racial and social justice issues. And I would say that, you know, what personally, and I think on behalf of Patagonia this last year is really broad is, we've long been held up at the, as this paragon for business activism and sustainability from the business sector. And the reality is on social and racial justice topics, we may have been progressive in our thinking and we may have taken steps that, that were meaningful and well-intentioned in the past, but I think really embracing becoming an anti-racist company and understanding the interconnectedness of all of this, I think has been a profound learning experience. And so for me, it's been really humbling this last year. And I would say that, you know, to your analogy, I, I don't think the learning is by any stretch over. Yeah, I, I keep going on and off mute, by the way, because my dog is snoring in the background. Um, so just as an FYI. But I won't no, take it personal. No, <laughs> no, it, it's interesting. I think the, the, the con when you're a student, uh, clearly you're engaged in active learning. And, and it was an honor to be, you know, to pursue um, you know, the, the master's at Johns Hopkins and, and be engaged in such a focused way. You know, I, I really resonate and love that comment about, you know, you're always learning at no, no matter what stage or, or point you're at. And I think there's a lot that we're starting to learn and to think about right now in this moment around people and planet. Um, I'm curious, Ryan, I'm going to one other question. And Lisa, you're welcome to, to jump in on this if it's if, if you want. But I'm just, you know, I keep thinking about the southeast, you know, Florida, Louisiana, like, in Cocoa Beach, which which is an area that you know obviously is more lowland and and um, uh, you know can be impacted by the 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 elements. I mean, when you were growing up, there were there very visible um, impacts that you were seeing that helped you know really strengthen your commitment around. I need to be focused on something in and around protecting the environment. I would say that 
climate change and the impacts from that. I'm 49 years old. So at the age I grew up, that was not something candidly I was thinking about. Um, we had hurricanes come through, I thought, and I, I still probably believe at that time that those were a pretty natural function of life that was part of the cycle. I think that what did have a really profound impact on me through an environmental lens, even growing up at that time, and I was a lot more focused on social justice issues. I had a a tragedy happened in my family, and that sort of put me on a course of, of really trying to understand some broader societal dynamics. And so that was a pretty formative part of my upbringing. But I think from an environmental point of view, the, the thing that I saw often was algae blooms in the river, uh, the Banana River, Indian River uh, estuaries that flow right behind Cocoa Beach, basically define like the Atlantic Ocean does on one side, that, on one side that the geography of that area. And um, we would regularly get these algae blooms that would kill the uh, marine life, and they were coming from agricultural runoff. And so I think, you know, even at a really young age, I was experiencing that, not fully understanding it. And then I could understand more deeply a little bit later in life how the pieces went together. I would say much like Lisa's story, unfortunately, about her family home. Um, I, I don't expect that by the time I'm done living, I'm not sure that Cocoa Beach will continue to exist. Um, I certainly don't think it will for my grandkids. And that's a pretty sobering reality. Um, thankfully, not a current one. But um, but yeah, that's, mm -hmm. I think we need to be prepared to deal with those realities. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that is you compound that with racism, with the impact of, uh, you know, hard fought for um, property that is already low lying, not well protected, levees that aren't maintained and that then break and devastate entire communities. Um, you know, that is also part of growing up in the South uh, when I grew up. Um, and so I feel deeply the interconnection between uh, climate and climate justice, environmental justice, this idea that simply being able to protect the waterfront communities that are worth a lot of money uh, on somebody's book um, is not enough. And mm. that whether it's mitigation or now adaptation, we need to build a cadre of people who have credibility in communities to help communities get ready for the kind of change Jane mentioned. Um, you know, people uh, dealing with for example, the kinds of diseases that we used to associate with much more tropical places than the southeastern part of the United States because the climate has changed such that mosquitoes and other vectors don't die off. I mean, these are real things and they're gonna have profound impacts on health. And right. COVID taught us one other thing, which is that health and health care are not equitably distributed in this world. So we have lots of work to do. And um, I mean, I'm not surprised that people of conscience look at this and feel motivated to act as, as Ryan said. Yeah, and I, you know, admittedly, Lisa, I'm embarrassed. I, don't, I didn't really know the scope or depth of environmental justice until this year. Until, until when? Until this year. And, you know, I've always, uh, well, anyway, but, but, um, and now, Ryan, I am going to sound, this is me being an infomercial, but we we did, uh, uh, and this is a, a plug for our previous panel that we did on environmental justice with Jackie uh, Patterson, who heads up environmental justice for the NAACP, Justin Cummings, who is the former mayor of Santa Cruz, uh, and Mark Lopez, who was a um, Goldman Prize uh, recipient a number of years ago. That was a great panel, and if after this one, if you enjoy, have enjoyed this this conversation, I um, encourage our audience to just Google Hopkins Business of Saving the Planet. There are other episodes, but that one was really powerful um, to to go deep down into environmental justice. But um, but yeah, and Jane, I'm curious, you know, because you travel, you've well up until COVID, you've been traveling all over the world, and you've seen environments and places change um, all all over the world. I'm, I'm just curious where that has shown up in your life and, you know, maybe what hope you can give us. <laughs> to. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, I'm a lot older than any of you, so I've seen more <laughs> change. I mean, when I when I grew up, there wasn't even any television, let alone the way we're communicating now. And the, we had 
we had what we called the wireless and initially it was just one program so but to get to to go to what you know some of the other people have been talking about about transformative things in my childhood there were several and i think one was growing up i was only five when world war ii started but growing up at that time made me absolutely not take anything for granted food was rationed clothes were rationed petrol was rationed people we knew were dying bombs were falling my uncle was a surgeon and he worked himself to the bone day and night looking after the wounded people in the blitz and so that that made a big impact on me and the biggest impact of all when it comes to social justice was seeing the victims who survived the holocaust the skeletal bodies the almost like zombies and seeing the bodies piled up and it was the first time i came really face to face with what i call true evil and i spent hours and hours up my favorite tree i'm, I'm in the house where i grew up it's just out there thinking about good and evil and it it made a huge impact and then when i first went to africa because i was invited by this school friend i had to save up money i hadn't been to college i had to save up money working in a hotel just around the corner there as a waitress which was very hard work and i was with a whole lot of irish catholics i was the only non-professional uh, wait staff there and so i learned about all of the things that that bothered them they they came from ireland and we talked about what was going on in ireland but then there were no planes going back and forth when i first went to africa and it was boat we we should have gone you know nice fairly short two week trip uh through the suez canal but there was some peculiar war between britain and egypt at the time so the suez canal was closed and so the boat went all the way around africa and the first place i actually set foot on african soil and i dreamed about africa living with wild animals since i was 10 years old and it was cape town and it was so beautiful the iconic table mountain <clears throat> this new smells and everything and my mother had some friends there and they'd offered to take me around for the two days the ship was in dock and <clears throat> So it was wonderful until I noticed that on the back of all the seats the doors into the hotels restaurants everywhere there were these words in Afrikaans slechtsprong I said what does this mean well it meant white people only and I was I hadn't been brought up like that my grandfather was a congregational minister we didn't judge people by the color of their skin or their culture or even their religion and so i couldn't wait to leave south africa and of course i lived to see the end of apartheid not the end of problems in south africa and meet the icon nelson mandela uh, i never met martin luther king in in america sadly so you know all of those events helped to shape who i am today when i was young there wasn't any talk of saving the environment but i did by accident really learn how the war which had influenced me so much caused the beginning of the destruction by huge multinational uh, timber companies because i was invited i'm not quite sure why it's strange but i was invited to a conference where the heads of the five biggest european timber companies came together with all their i don't know it was a big conference and i sat in horror listening to this man who'd been with the companies ever since the war saying well of course after the war was over the infrastructure of europe was so damaged and there wasn't enough timber and so on to make this to rebuild and so they sat down and they divided up the forests in america south america and in indonesia 
and in Africa. And Africa came last in this list. But when I heard them saying, you know, we're going into these countries and we're going to take their timber. So accidentally, the war led to that, which was my first real impact with, with the, the horror of deforestation, you know, one of the great lungs of the world. And we've destroyed half of the forests that ever existed on this planet. So it all came very gradually, but all of these little things slotted into place and made me who I am today. And yes, I've seen vast change. I mean, I've seen so much change in the environment. Here in England, in Bournemouth, more than half the bird species that I knew as a child are gone. They're not here anymore. Places have been paved over and there's been all this herbicide and pesticides used. And it's, you know, that's just one tiny example of what's gone wrong in the world. And there's so much in big corporations that's to blame, whether it's agribusiness or industrial agriculture, that particularly animal farming and the harm that that's done to the environment, the pollution of the ocean, the other great lungs of the world. Yeah, horrifying change. Jane, what gives you hope? Well, I've got um, four reasons for hope, which uh, the, people say to me, Jane, you don't really have hope, do you? I mean, you can't, you've seen all this destruction and, and pain and suffering and all the rest of it. Well, I do believe that we have a window of time. I don't believe it's a very big window of time. And I think it's still slowly closing, but we have this window of time. And my reasons for hope are first of all, the human intellect, because although we haven't always used it wisely, and I specifically say intellect and not intelligence, because an intelligent person doesn't destroy its home. But our intellect, I mean, it's what, makes us more different than anything else, even from our closest relatives, the chimps, the explosive development of our intellect. So yeah, chimps can learn to use computers and do very complex problems. But just think, we've designed a rocket that went up to Mars and a robot that crawled around taking photos. That at one time was thought maybe could support life. We don't want to go and live there. We've seen those photos. And so, it's really bizarre that this most intellectual creature is destroying its only home. But now we see people are beginning to use that intellect in a wise way and find search for ways of innovative technology that can help us live in harmony. I mean, solar is just one example. And also people are beginning to think about their own individual environmental footprints and companies more and more companies have got the message. Sometimes it's consumer pressure. Well, people aren't going to buy our, our goods if we don't pull ourselves together and be a bit more environmentally responsible. Very often it's change of heart in the CE and the staff of the company. I've met it again and again. So that's one reason for hope. Second reason, nature, give her a chance, is amazing in the way it can come back. And I could give so many examples. I've seen them all around the world. Sometimes we've harmed nature so badly that we have to give her a helping hand. But um, Ryan, what you were talking about, you know, protecting the rivers and the, um, the importance of removing dams and things like that, that's where the intellect comes in. And then once the intellect comes in, then the river, and the life around the river will come in and start restoring itself. And the next reason for hope is young people. And I won't go on talking about that now, maybe later, but I started a program for young people back in 1991. They called it Roots and Shoots. It began with 12 high school students in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Worried, they were worried about, some of them were worried about the illegal dynamiting, destroying the coral reefs. Some were worried, why isn't the government doing more to prosecute the poachers? They're killing our elephants and our lions in our national parks. 
And why aren't more people worried about the street children with no homes? And why are people throwing stones at stray dogs? And why are the animals tied up in the market in the blazing sun with no shade and no water? So that led to a, a gathering. They brought their friends. And we decided the most important message, every single one of us matters. Every single one of us has some role to play. Every single one of us makes an impact of some sort every single day. And we decided, you know, when I was in the rainforest, my favorite place in the world, I learned about the interrelationship of all the different species of plants and animals and how the loss of one species might seem insignificant, but that could lead to the loss of another that may be primarily fed on it. And so this ecosystem, this, this biodiversity of the ecosystem, which I like to call the tapestry of life, because it's so much more poetic. And I, I see it as each species going, tears a hole in that web until the web is so tattered, the tapestry is so tattered that the ecosystem can collapse. So we decide that at each group, and they would mostly be in schools and their classes or after school clubs, would tackle three projects, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. This was just before I began the Take Care Takari program. And so from that small start, 12 students, now the program is in nearly 60 countries. It's been in others, but it's not active there anymore. And it makes me very happy that it's right across most of Europe. It's um, very strong in most of the United States and Canada. It's growing quite fast in Latin America. It's all over China. We've got over 2000 groups in mainland China and it started in the Middle East as well. And when young people are empowered, when we listen to them, when they understand the problems, there's no stopping them. They're so full of energy, commitment, passion, and sometimes courage. And we now have members in kindergarten, very strong in university, and even now some groups forming among adults. Like the latest one was DocuSign is getting its staff involved all around the world, and I hope other companies will follow suit because it's changing lives. And then the last one, the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle what seems totally impossible. And they may be laughed at, scorned, threatened, but they carry on and they either succeed or they inspire so many people that the result comes even after they're dead. And ordinary people, refugees who come to a country with nothing, they're probably discriminated against, but they build a little life for themselves. You go and buy something from their little shop and they smile at you if you bother to talk to them. Thank you, Jane. Um, we're gonna move on that note to the Q and A uh, portion of our panel right now. And uh, Dr. Jen DeRosa, who is an amazing uh, lecturer and professor at, uh, for the Hopkins Environmental Sciences and Policies Master Program and the program coordinator for the Energy and Environmental Program. Um, it's my honor to introduce you. And um, I will just say, in addition to an amazing professor, you're also a great <laughs> advisor and you were a great advisor for me. So anyway, I will leave it to you to help lead our Q&A portion. Well, thank you very much, Scott. Oops, sorry, hold on a second. My camera is moving around. So thank you very much, Scott. And I just wanna say thank you to all of our panelists and thank you also to our, our uh, viewers that are watching today. I also wanna remind our viewers that they can ask questions on the Hopkins at Home uh, website by entering a question into the Q&A bar that they see right underneath the video that they are watching. Um, and for that, I am going to give voice to the viewers' questions. Um, and we've had several come in already. Um, the first question I wanna ask is actually a general question for any of the panelists. Um, a few of you, it sounds like there was a, a person or persons along the way that shaped your leadership path to help spark your passion to become an agent of change and also to help guide it. 
Um, can you speak more about the role of mentorship in environmental leadership? And this is just anyone who wants to take it up. Uh, well, I'll go first. Uh, I mean, one of one of uh, my heroes, heroes, is sitting right here. So um, it's really important to have. I, I mentioned my pediatrician growing up. I think, especially uh, what what Jane's Roots and Shoots program is doing, is giving young people an ability to see themselves in this movement, which for too often, you know, environment was something that happens to you instead of you being an active an engaged partner, especially if you're in an urban area or a developed area where you might not have the same level of access to the world's beautiful places. And so what you see of your environment uh, is, it is in need of, of help. Um, and so I think mentors and uh, advisors and coaches are really incredible things, not just from a professional career standpoint, but because you never know who you might be inspiring just by example of how you're approaching your work and living your life. And I think that is, this is about the business of the environmental movement. I think that is so important at companies as well. Um, one of the things I wanna echo that uh, the very wise Jane uh, said is, you know, I, I was 18, 19 years old and I dreamed of, an, of engineers who, carried the environmental ethic right, right alongside their, their uh, training. That is what I see at Apple today. I mean, our engineers are as driven as uh, anyone to try to find a way to use recycled materials in our products, to cut our carbon footprint, to cut our impact on, uh, on communities uh, where mining might occur. Our engineers are incredibly driven on energy efficiency. They're incredibly driven around clean energy. Our procurement team, you know, are, are incredibly driven to get our supply chain onto clean energy. And so it really is happening that somewhere along the way, the mentors, the teachers, the programs, like a young Scott who said, I have to go back and learn how to do this in the in the world um, that, I, that I work in every day, that's happening. And so I wanna just say that um, whatever profession, you know, these students you end up going into, whether it be the public sector, NGO or private sector, that, you know, look for and look for mentors, but also don't forget that your voice as an employee is exactly uh, influential in this moment because employers are looking to, to recruit talent like yourself. And so speaking up and saying, this is important to me really does matter uh, in terms of determining what, what your employer does. Thank you, Lisa. That's nice to hear that. Thank you. Um, we have, I just wanna make sure if anyone else wants to answer that before I move to another question. I'll, I'll add just a couple of quick right. thoughts. Um, you know, I think for me personally, I, I'm not sure that I've ever had a mentor, but I've certainly been incredibly inspired over the course of my life, continue to be by just finding people that are working at the front lines of issues on and topics against long odds that I, I think are worthwhile. Jane mentioned the fact that every, you know, significant societal transformation that we've ever had is really driven by a small group of dedicated individuals who are working backwards from a big goal when it first passes, it seems like it's impossible. And I think the one thing I would say to people, particularly students is often the way that the curve seems to go is you're idealistic at a young age and then you just kind of have that beaten out of you by both life experience and uh, I would say almost like reverse mentorship, people telling you all the reasons why things can't happen. And I think the best mentors in life, whether you have a personal relationship with them or you're inspired from a distance are those people that just refuse to believe that the things worth doing can't be done. And that, that I think is a set of mentors that you can find even, you know, in a bookstore and online. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Um, we have a bunch of questions that, that are actually centered around a common theme. And I'll, I'll ask the first question, but it's generally for the entire panel and I'll let whoever wants to answer, answer. Um, for the panelists, how do you overcome bias against race, gender, when trying to perform outreach and educate others about environmental issues? 
in your organization or just generally speaking? I'll go first. All right, thank Say you. Say that, that that is one of the wonderful outcomes of our Roots and Shoots program because very deliberately from the beginning, we've tried to bring together young people from different backgrounds, different ethnic groups, different cultures, different religions. And it's something you see in very young children. They, make, they don't discriminate at all, absolutely not. They only learn that later. But as we bring our young people together, they, you can see them actually understanding that much more important than the color of your skin or your culture or your religion or your age or your socioeconomic status is the fact, goodness, we're all human beings. We learn that our blood is actually the same. We all cry and we all laugh. We all get joy, we all get sad. And we really are one human family. And that was an outcome that slowly grew out of the program. And the first time we brought young people together from, I think it was 20 different countries, we had uh, a, an Israeli, a young man in Israeli he was 20 or something, and two Palestinians, refugees in America. And at first they wouldn't look at each other. I mean, they literally would not look at each other. By the end of the four days, I don't think they went to bed. They stayed, they were talking about how can we create peace between our countries. So it, it's, it's really one of the things I'm so happy about with Roots and Shoots is this beginning to understand other cultures, other religions. And the last thing I'll say there, which I suppose in a way goes back to mentorship, but after the war, World War II, you know, you can imagine that we hated Germans. I mean, they were bombing, they were killing, they were flattening our cities. Of course, we were doing the same, but they started it. And at the end of the war, you know, still, if you heard a German voice, you kind of felt a, a, an illogical shiver. And my mother let me go off to Germany to live with the family for three months. They wanted somebody to teach their children good English because she wanted me to understand that Germans and Nazis were different, that Germans were not bad people, that the Nazi regime was. Wasn't that amazing of her back then at that time, just after the war when she'd lost her brother-in-law and various other close friends? Thank you, Jane. I think we all could learn a lot about overcoming bias from roots and shoots. Thank you. Um, and before I move on to another question, I want to make sure that um, Ryan or Lisa, if you had any other thoughts about that. Yeah, I, look, I think uh, that is an extraordinary story, um, Jane. But yeah, look, I, I think that you fight bias every single day. That's how you fight it. You, you don't give up, you know, and another, uh, Another hero is John Lewis and the women of the civil rights movement as well, because oftentimes we talk about the men of the civil rights movement, but we don't necessarily call out all the women. But, um, you know, sometimes what gives me hope is realizing that against odds that if you had to try to, you know, put numbers to them, they're just astronomically against you. But I do believe the arc of the universe has to bend towards justice. And I, I do believe that um, in good trouble. And I do believe that um, you have to fight every day to be heard. And I think the, the only advice I give mentorees of mine is if you, if you find yourself in a toxic environment where the person who simply will not honor your voice, you have to move on. You can try to change it from the outside, but changing that from the inside is soul crushing. I have been fortunate in my career to never have that kind of a position, but I try to actively work in meetings to find the people around the sides of the room who don't feel like their voice is as important as the people who might be sitting at the table and encourage them to use their voice and give their perspective. Because that's usually the perspective that is a part of the blind spot for the organization. So wherever you are, I think you have to be 
Uh, Ryan said anti-racist. I absolutely agree with that. You have to be anti-sexist. You have to work to actually undo the natural tendency. And what I do worry about, Ryan talked about this idea that they beat, they beat your idealism out of you. Uh, it's often more subtle than that. It's, you know, do I have the energy today to fight um, what is the inertia that can, can be racism? And you have to do that because if you don't do it, it's not gonna change. So um, I, I believe one of the sad parts of this moment is realizing that a lot of the battles that we thought have been fought and won need to be fought and won every day. Thank yeah, you. I, I would just say I, I completely agree with that. I think the two biggest challenges we face right now as humans are the environmental crisis and tribalism. And I think the latter is compromising our ability to navigate the first. And I think, I think more democracy is a critical part of the solution to that. And I'm really troubled as I think so many of us are with overt attempts to, to block access to voting um, that's happening right now. We talk a lot about Georgia, but there's 40, 46 other states that are engaged in the same behavior. And this is not uniquely an American problem, although we seem to be seeking to perfect it at the moment. And um, you know, it's why we as a company, and, and I say this with humility, and I say it recognizing our imperfections on these issues, have, have put a million dollars a week ago behind into two organizations, Black Votes Matter and the New Georgia Project, to try to ensure that grassroots organizations working on the front line to ensure that everybody has got equal access to the ballot. We think it's critically important as we think it's critically important that companies and individuals and others champion federal legislation that can make it more difficult for states to undermine this intent. We're going to continue to be on the front lines of this conversation as, as this spreads across other states. And I think that's critically important. And again, we bring a real dose of humility to this because this is not our, this is something we feel is critical. We feel like it ladders back to our mission, being in business to save our home planet. But it is not an area where we, you know, it's an area that we have been engaged with the right to vote and access to voting, but it's been with an environmental lens. And I think we have recognized the need to expand upon that. Thank you, Ryan. It's really nice to see organizations supporting social justice issues and voting rights issues. Um, our next question is specifically for Lisa. And um, the question is, how does Apple use its enormous platform to speak out on topics like climate change and racial equity and justice? Thanks. Look, we believe we have a responsibility that's you know, really deeply ingrained in the DNA of this company to leave the world better than we find it. And to also leverage our resources to do good to lead in that way as well. So we do advocate for laws and regulations that enable the transition to renewable energy that uh, minimize the world's reliance on coal and fossil fuels. Tim, our CEO, speaks on these issues uh, often, even, even on issues where the beliefs aren't widely held or accepted by others. You know, He called for a carbon neutral economy during the recent UN Climate Ambitions Summit. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, he spoke out against Georgia's new restrictive voting law. We've also uh, spoken about the other states and the, our belief that voting should be, be easier than ever these days. And technology has certainly proven to be an aid in other tough challenges. Uh, we carry so much information on our uh, smartphones, and there's no reason why we couldn't see a world where technology is used to make sure every single person uh, is able to vote easily and securely and safely and, you know, in a manner that's verified. Uh, so we're really proud to lend our voices and resources to systemic challenges. Um, we have a racial equity and justice initiative, which was started last year and announced by Tim after the murder of George Floyd uh, and the social uh, issues that that portended. And that looks at the systemic issues that, it, that inhibit black and brown people from success, issues around uh, education, of course, our criminal justice system, and economic empowerment so that communities have the investment and the opportunity to create 
wealth and and uh, and determine their own destinies. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Um, the next question is actually a broad question for anyone. We're getting a lot of these. Um, and this can go two ways, actually. What are the top two to three sustainability metrics that the three of you track either within your own organizations um, in terms of sustainability um, and how do they hold your how do you hold your teams and organizations accountable um, regarding progress for those metrics? And I was thinking you could also turn this in a different direction in terms of when you're looking at other organizations and you're trying to gauge whether or not they're truly sustainable, um, do you look at those metrics too? Um, so kind of opening up the form uh, to that question. Uh, I'm happy to, to offer a couple of thoughts quickly. Um, I think for us, we've been focused on really trying to have an impact at a very grassroots level through much of our history. So since 1985, we committed to giving 1% of revenue to grassroots organizations working on clean air, clean water, clean soil, protecting wild places. And, and we've not put metrics behind that. We, you know, instead we, we meet with organizations regularly and, and we fund through that stream. And, and we just continue to, to, we have continued to focus on having as much impact as we could or spreading as many seeds as we could and see, see what ultimately came of it. I think as we project forward, we understand that we've got to focus a lot more on, on um, root cause issues, not just symptoms of the climate, ecological and social crises. And so I think that, you know, one of the frameworks is the science-based targets. I think it's important, but it's imperfect. And I think that the space of offsets is important, but imperfect. And so one of the things we're really focused on, in addition to using our voice and our money and our people and otherwise is, how can we, how can we set a, a standard and an expectation of how do we minimize our footprint? And then also how do we amplify the good that we do? And so there's quite a bit of work that we're um, engaged in there really around scaling regenerative organic agricultural practices, nature-based solutions to the climate crisis. But I think the other piece within our core business that's really critical to us is circularity. And we do product repair at scale. We buy clothing back from people um, if they're done using it and it still has usable life and we'll resell it. And I think ultimately just creating a relationship with our customers where it's as easy to buy something secondhand, send it to us at the end of life or get it repaired as it is to buy a brand new product. I think ultimately that's, that's really, I think the system that we all need to operate within as much as possible as we look ahead. Yeah, I, I would just echo those because uh, they're so similar to the, the answers I had in my, my mind. Um, first, I look for companies that have a really accurate uh, carbon accounting process in place. And so, I mean, I, I've watched over the eight years I've been at Apple, how we have every year, we fine tune our carbon footprint and we do our carbon footprint from start to finish from uh, the raw materials all the way through manufacturing, all the way through sales, all the way through customer use. So part of our uh, carbon footprint is the energy that customers have to use to charge the devices we make. And so I, I know what that takes and I know we're constantly refining it. So I wanna see a company that's really drilling down on that data because if you don't understand it, you can't make meaningful uh, changes. You can't find the, the root causes of problems. So we, you know, we have a, a metric around our carbon footprint, which is we need to be carbon neutral by 2030 and 75% or more of that's gonna come from switching from dirty energy to clean energy. So we're not, it's not an offset based strategy. Although in this day and age, some carbon removal and investment in nature-based carbon removal, we think is smart. Uh, and then around circularity, since that's our other big metric, we've made a commitment to try to make our products as much as possible and one day, hopefully 100% from recycled or renewable materials. So that way we're creating a market for recycled electronic components and materials um, to try to cut down on the amount of raw material that has to be taken from the earth. And that has, has been a wonderful journey. Uh, I mentioned our engineers are really engaged in it. Um, and the products that we're shipping today have a much higher recycled content than even a few years ago. And our roadmaps are uh, 
is are all about increasing that number, not just because of the impact on biodiversity uh, and communities, both really important, but because it has a huge impact on our carbon footprint as well. I would add that uh, one of the projects which is chosen, Roots and Toots is about choosing your project. We don't dictate, it's grassroots. And one of the things that's being picked up on all over the world in all our groups is recycle, reuse. They're really passionate about recycling. They have dress parades made out of recycled materials. They're forcing their parents to recycle. They're getting really angry when when some of their friends throw away a dress because they've worn it once. Even if they hand it on, why don't you wear it again? There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I'm wearing some clothes that, uh, that I had maybe 15 years ago. And it's funny, if you keep something long enough, it comes back in fashion, actually. <laughs> but uh, another thing that's very important to us, as well as, you know, mentoring the young people and helping them, and it's incredible what they're doing. Uh, one young girl changed the whole of the, the recycling, reusing program in Chengdu in China and got her mother and her friend's mothers to work helping them with this program and got the city involved. I mean, it's quite extraordinary, the power of youth. But the other thing is uh, with our NGO, one of the things that's really important is I know that there are some executives of some of the NGOs and they go around in their private planes and they stay in the most expensive hotels and they have big expense accounts. I've seen it, we've met them. And that is really hypocritical. So what we try to do, and there are, there are 24 Jane Goodall Institutes now in 24 countries, and they're all a bit different. Um, but what we try to do and keep as, a, as an ethic is not to have that sort of carbon footprint in our own staff. And in our Takari program now in six countries, uh, one of the things which I find has been really, really significant is introducing microfinance programs. And they're based on Mohammed Yunus, who was one of my heroes. He took me to Bangladesh. I met the women who'd never touched money before. And they all cried when they told me what it was like before he helped them. So in our microcredit programs in the villages, we loan money only to environmentally sustainable small business projects. So we're, we're trying to do our bit. And yes, I flew around the world. I used airplanes. I used, you know, but people are still telling me, Jane, I know, but please come back because although we love you on Zoom, we must have you back. We really want you. You encourage us. You inspire us to do better. So I don't know, but as millions of our youth, millions, are planting trees. I just hope that my small little bits of commercial flying aren't making too much impact on, on the greenhouse gases. Well, it's, it's exciting to hear how all three of your organizations are, are, have wonderful goals and metrics to, to make improvements in the world. Um, our last, uh, our next question is, is actually largely focused on indigenous, empowering ind indigenous peoples um, around the world and making sure that they have a seat at the table when it comes to making the world a better place. And this question actually was supposed to be for the panel, but I think Jane might be the best person um, to direct it towards um, based on the work that your organization is doing. Um, how is your organization listening to indigenous practices and leaders when tackling um, sustainability slash conservation initiatives? And I know that your own organization is actually doing so much with uh, community-based conservation. So um, would you like to answer that question, Jane? Well, I sort of already mentioned that we started this Takari program because working with the local people and having them become partners is really the only way that you can ensure any conservation program. And even then you're not safe because you get an autocratic president who can undo everything in a moment, but you just have not to think of that. You just have to go on. And okay, if somebody comes along like the 
now deceased president of Tanzania and builds a dam in the middle of a World Heritage Site in the river there and destroys all the environment. Well, nature will return and he's gone now. So hopefully that project is finished. But all around the world in our different um, Jane Goodall institutes, we work as much as possible with indigenous communities. And they have so much respect for the environment. We can learn so much from them. We learn about the medicinal plants that they use. And isn't it interesting that in Tanzania, the local people and the chimpanzees use the same medicinal plants for the same kind of ailments. I, I love that. But anyway, we, we, tr we are developing roots and shoots in indigenous communities. And I have many, many indigenous friends in Native Americans, First Nation, this extraordinary indigenous group in Taiwan. They made me a princess. And I think my favorite gift from a Native American community was the Cherokee uh, group in Oklahoma. And they gave me a, a, a ceremonial name, which is an honor. And it was Sister of Mother Earth. If you need something to keep you going, fighting for the earth, it's to be told, well, you're her sister. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. That's really lovely. Our next question is for all the panelists. We actually have hundreds of graduate students watching right now, I'm sure. Um, I know because they're asking questions and they're saying, this is so-and-so graduate students and they're identifying themselves. Um, so for all the panelists, anyone who wants to take this question, what advice do you have who are interested in conservation, climate change, and environmental issues on an international level and the challenges that they may face? Just sort of advice as they're, as they're thinking of tackling these big issues, where to start? Join Roots and Shoots, full stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> you know, I'll just say quickly that I think one of the big shortcomings of the environmental movement is this belief that everybody needs to engage the same way. You know, we all need to stop flying. We all need to stop eating meat. We should show up at, at protests. Um, I, I think that those things can be really important. And if you're so moved to participate in that way, do. But I think what it fails to really honor is all the unique gifts that everybody brings. And I think that, um, look, if you're a great, if you're a great orator, speak. If you're a great writer, write. If you're a graphic designer, volunteer with organizations working on these issues that can benefit from your skill sets and accountants and otherwise. So I think educating yourself, figuring out what you're passionate about, but also understanding that, that your engagement does not need to be formulaic. I think we're better off if we truly celebrate both the diversity of what people enjoy, but also what they bring. Yeah, and I think Thank I'm you. gonna third roots and shoots with uh, a, a caveat, which is when I look at my career, as I'm old enough now to look back at this long career, um, you know, the first jobs I had were working in communities that were affected by hazardous waste. Um, and I believe that the ability to get as close to the problem and the people uh, or the uh, area impacted is super important. I meet too many people even today who speak about problems in the third person, not having really gotten their hands dirty. The time right out of school is the best time to get your hands dirty, even if it's metaphorically, you don't have to be in the field, but you can insist that the communities that are impacted be represented in the rooms that you're in. You can insist to get as close as possible to the problem so you really understand it. The basis of change is really understanding the problem and not necessarily picking up what you know someone else is telling you or um, or what is sort of the common given wisdom. You know, um, I, I think you know Jane was in Apple's Think Different campaign many years ago, and it was exactly that because she went and she saw firsthand what was happening, and then she she 
determine what she was going to do about it. And so as close as you can get, even if that's from an office, the people you bring in and the ways you approach a problem should be connected to the folks who are actually experiencing it. Uh, that is incredibly important because the world is experiencing climate change and the places in the world that are experiencing it need to be part of the solution um, uh, for the problem. Thank you. Yeah, very inspiring words. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question for the panel because we're getting close to our, our ending time. Um, and. I always like to end things with our Q&A on a, a forward-thinking, positive note. Um, as we've talked already that we've faced many challenges, but we've seen how your organizations and you yourselves as leaders um, have really become change agents and found ways to overcome these challenges and worked um, and strive to overcome them. So for our panelists, um, what is one thing that you're looking forward to seeing um, being tackled and overcame or overcome in the coming uh, 10, five, 10 years with regards to either sustainability or conservation um, of the many kind of, as Dr. Burgess mentioned at the beginning, wicked issues um, that we face? Um, what do you see in the future as you kind of look into your crystal ball? Um, that may be something we're gonna tackle in the next five to 10 years. And really quickly, if anyone has a burning desire, we probably only have time for one person to respond, not to uh, put anyone on the hot seat, but I do we think we- could do a yeah. quick, really quick response. Optimistic response. <laughs> you. you shut us up nicely, didn't you? You're welcome. <laughs> I think the last word should come from Jane. No, I, I, I will second that very strongly. <laughs> oh. I will third. <laughs> That's really not fair. Please. But but um, okay. So what do we need to do in the future? The pandemic has taught us a lot, and the pandemic we brought on ourselves because of our disrespect of the natural world and our absolute disrespect of animals, creating all these conditions for a virus to jump over, to spill over from an animal and it formed this new COVID-19 disease. So in the future, what I look for is a new relationship with the natural world and with animals, a respect that animals are sentient beings with their own personalities. And so all of these conditions, we put them in our factory farms and our wildlife markets and the way we treat animals in puppy mills and so on, uh, shocking and we need to change that which means more education and more children in roots and shoots yes and um, secondly we somehow and that's something all of you people know far more about than me but somehow we need to form a new more sustainable greener economy and it's beginning to happen I mean there are people out there wanting that and moving towards that I see it all the time. It's just some of these autocratic heads of state that are the, the barrier for probably what is the will of the masses. And finally, I'd say there's so much more good going on in the world than people realize because the media loves to concentrate on all the doom and the gloom, which we need to know about. But goodness, the people out there doing amazing things, the projects, restoring nature, saving animals from extinction. We need more of that because that's what gives people hope. And without hope, you fall into this apathy um, and, and do nothing. And if we all get together, so my, my children in Tanzania, children, they're not their university and everything, my students in Roots and Shoots, they were getting together at the end of when they came to share, saying, together we can, meaning we can save the world. And they kind of stood up and it looked a little bit too much like a Nazi. But anyway, together we can. And I said, yes, we can. We know we can. But will we? So now they say, together we can, together we will. And when I was doing my lectures around the world, that's how I tried to end up. And it's great to see 10,000 people stand up and yell out, together we can, together we will. It's the will that we need. 
the can we have already under our belts. Thank you so much, Jane. And then I'll cut back to Scott so he can say goodbye for everyone. Thank you, Jen. Lisa, I know you got a hard stop. You can jump at any point, no offense. We won't be offended whatsoever. I'm gonna just run through some quick thank yous. Um, on the Hopkins side, Dr. Jerry Burgess, uh, Dr. Jen DeRosa, Tasha Overpeck, and Vicki Schneider, thank you so much for all of your help on this. From uh, the Jane Goodall Institute, uh, Jane, clearly thank you. Uh, Susanna named Dan DuPont, Ashley Sullivan, Anna Rathman, Mary Lewis, and Paul Barabout, thank you again for all of your help. Um, at Patagonia, Ryan, uh, Dean Carter and Jessica Davis, thank you for your partnership and collaboration on, on this. At Apple, Lisa and Ali O'Shaughnessy, thank you so much for your work here. And then at the Hydric uh, camp, Katie DeHaas, Leah Rendazzo, uh, Kristen Munoz, and Josh Annisfeld, thank you so much. There are more thank yous. If I've missed anyone, I apologize, but we got to wrap this up quick. And again, thank you so much to Jane Lisa and Ryan for allocating their time with us. If you loved this discussion, feel free to Google Business of Saving the Planet. Um, there, we've done three other episodes. And if you're looking forward to doing something in person, our next gathering will hopefully be in person and hopefully um, coming up this summer or fall. Thank you again, everyone. Hope you enjoyed joining us and uh, we'll talk with you later. Bye.